latest cold chain conversation. I'm so delighted to have so many great speakers and such a great attendance for today's session. So cold chain conversations are our sort of virtual events where we bring together some really interesting experts to talk about a subject that is of real interest to our industry right now. And I don't think there's a topic that could be more interesting than the issue of the space race. The, you know, it is a very exciting time in terms of cold chain development in the UK and across Europe and in fact across the world. My name is Shane Brennan and I'm the Chief Executive of the Cold Chain Federation and I'll in the UK and I'll be uh, chairing today's uh, today's proceedings. Um, and um, so I'll, throughout, I'll be trying to sort of moderate the conversation, bring out, bring in the different uh, different speakers and their contributions, trying to move the conversation along. Um, so we've got, we've got a lot of speakers and a lot of content to get through in an, an hour and 15 minutes. So um, yeah, so, 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 so it's gonna be fast paced, I'm sure. Um, if you have any thoughts or questions, please share them. Um, do so by you typing your questions into the question box, um, which is provided uh, there. Um, and um, I will look at those questions and hopefully bring those into the conversation as we go along. If we can't uh, deal with your questions um, during, the, during the actual session, what we'll do is we'll capture all those questions and we will send you uh, responses to those questions in the aftermath of the event. The event's also being recorded, so um, please, uh, it will be available to watch back and to share after the event. So, um, you know, uh, please, please, if you enjoy the session, please make people aware of it um, after the fact. So the topic of today's session is the space race. Now we published a report in partnership with one of our panelists today, Savills, um, late last year. We wanted to ask ourselves the question, you know, how much cold chain facilities, how much cold storage is there in the UK right now? And you know, unfortunately, there isn't a perfect data set for that. Um, and there hasn't been for some time. And that's something the Cold Chain Federation is looking to address. And our first step towards doing that was this partnership with Savills, and where we looked at data for England and Wales uh, valuation data, so the, gov so the government sort of business rates registry um, and looking at what they had in terms of cold storage and that's what we came, we, where, where we generated this, this, this report. So that told us that there are about 678 facilities, over 50,000 square feet, which is about 5,000 square meters. Um, uh, so um, across a different types of use, you know, third party storage, farming, producing, both private and public cold chain. That's one of the key things about our sector, obviously, is those that are selling storage as a service and those that are have storage as part of their, their operations. Um, lots of similarities and lots of differences between those two types of operating. Um, the other thing that we found is that, and it's, you know, we don't need to do a piece of research to know that there is a big development pipeline in place right now. You know, really exciting new facilities coming up across the UK. Um, what with uh, things like the lineage facilities in Peterborough and other places, um, the, the, the Magnavel proposals at growth at, at, at Easton near Bristol, the new, new coal facility at Corby, um, the CFAST facility at Felixstowe, but also some of the, and also some of the smaller operations like, well, smaller facilities like the one for the Nagel Group in, 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 on, the, on the Wirral, um, and supermarkets also with restructuring their, their regional distribution center networks with things like the Waitrose NDC, and, and, and others. It's an exciting time with lots of activity. Um, our estimate is at about 16.7 million square foot of in the development pipeline. And I think we undercooked that at the end of last year. I think there's quite a bit more announcements since then. So I think you know there is a lot of space being built. And that's what we're gonna get into talking about now. So we've got a panel joining us today for the discussion. Um, and it's from, from them that we really wanna hear. So um, I'm just gonna introduce them all now. Um, so our first, um, well, Firstly, I'm going to introduce Henry Pringle, who's the Chief Operating Officer of the Constell of Constellation Cold Storage, um, a group of just bringing together a range of different uh, operations. He'll explain a bit more about that in a moment across Europe. And he's recently um, acquired uh, a cold storage business in the UK or made a, bought a big stake in that. Uh, Matteo Igati from Rabobank, um, who's one of the best analysts out there in terms of having looked at cold storage for a long time. Um, and he's got some really good insights to share about that. Professor Sandra Delieu um, from Wang, sorry, Wagenen University. Professor Sandra, you'll have to pronounce it better when you come in. I don't, uh, my Dutch isn't great. Um, who's a, you know, absolute expert in all things operations and supply chain, um, um, particularly within the food chain. Um, Julie Hansen our, from our friends at the Global Cold Chain Alliance, who she, she's the European director with members ranging across the whole of, uh, of Europe um, and obviously within the Global Cold Chain Alliance across the whole of the world. Um, and sorry, and and then finally, Will Cooper 
from Savills, um, who heads up their, 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 their developments team, and he'll introduce himself in a moment. So can I ask um, the panelists all to, uh, to join me now? Alexander? Perfect, look at that, brilliant choreography. Thank you all very much. Um, brilliant, so as I said, uh, we're gonna sort of just dive straight in and I'm gonna basically start asking questions and then people introduce themselves as we, as we bring people on stream. So I'm gonna kick off by asking you, Matteo, um, can you give us, you know, basically the premise of this session is that there's a space race happening. Is there a space race happening from your, from your analysis across in the UK and across Europe? And can you give us an idea of the amount of investment that's taking place right now? Thank you, thank you, Shane. Thank you for inviting us. Maybe um, just two words about uh, about my role at Rabo and and um, why I'm following Cold Chain. So I'm part of the food and agri uh, research team at Rabo in the supply chain uh, team, and I am 100% of my time on on food logistic, which includes also Cold Chain, and we scan the market. We look for market drivers. We look for investments and, and and try to understand where the market is going to have a strategic discussion with uh, with our clients. Coming to your question, uh, well, uh, it is a yes and no answer. So <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. the first one to go, and maybe I will be I will be uh, um, uh, uh, I will have a different opinion from uh, the people who will follow me speaking. But uh, I would say yes, uh, yes. But you know, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, nuances to to be considered. In terms of total investment, it's not easy to have a, a, a one number huh, for the for the old sector. What we can do is we, we can look at it from different perspective, of course. But looking at it from the real estate perspective, which is maybe the more comprehensive one, which includes all all sorts of of developments. In the last five years, uh, CRBE, which is an important consultant uh, uh, in real estate in in, in cold storage, has seen. 755 million coming in into the sector in Europe from different sources and from different types of, uh, of investors. And of course, uh, this was a prediction or yes, this was a, an analysis made before COVID uh, and uh, with all the changes that, uh, that this might imply. Uh, last year, for example, talking about uh, big numbers, we've seen Lineage, which racked a lot of uh, 1.9 billion for their future investments. They have announced, for example, in, uh, in 2015, uh, between expansions and, uh, and 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 greenfield uh, and greenfield projects, so indeed uh, there is uh, a race for space, um, and this race for space is dictated by the fact that fresh and frozen products are uh, uh, consumption is increasing, both in the UK and uh, uh, and the uh, in the European Union, but also if you look at the US, for example, and. Uh, also at, uh, in developing economies, if you want to have a, a little bit of a, a much broader uh, scope. Uh, what are people investing in? Uh, the, the, the hot commodity now, if we want to define this, is uh, high bay automated uh, um, warehouses, which can uh, speed up the throughput, we can allow to provide a wider range of uh, uh, services, high added value services. And uh, uh, this is maybe the, 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 the most important point that I want to, would like to highlight. We've been discussing uh, uh, recently with some of the technology providers uh, in this space, and, and they've seen uh, a lot of demand for uh, this kind of, of warehouses. Um, and let's say, looking at the figures for the last five years, I would say that we are looking at more or less the same amount uh, for the for the period that uh, for the period that is coming. Of course, it's not a, a final uh, a final figure, but that's that's the level uh, that's the level we're looking at. In terms of who's doing it, well, uh, looking at the news, uh, it seems that everybody is doing it uh, in their own way. Uh, we have a, a constellation uh, here in the panel, for example, that inside of it there is a. a, a yeah, what could be defined as small or yeah, medium uh, company, which is Stockable, which invested a lot in automated, uh, uh, really modern warehouses, but also, for example, the new calls of this world, they made of uh, uh, modern automated high bay warehouse that the, the, let's say the, the, you know, the recognizing feet of of their uh, uh, of their investment. Uh, in terms of where. Uh, we've seen a lot of developments close to close to uh, uh, um, logistic hubs like ports in Rotterdam and uh, in other uh, uh, places in, in Spain, in Southern Europe, in Italy. Uh, we have seen that. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's a little bit uh, uh, 
on one side is this, on the other, of course, uh, there is a, a demand for capacity close to, to big uh, population area, a really dense population area. And uh, now the, 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 for the ones who serve a specific uh, food uh, sector or a specific food producer, the trend is to build it right next to right next to the right next to the factory. So th the picture is not uh, super uniform, but there are some uh, uh, drivers that we that we can consider. Uh, that, thank you, Matteo. Matteo, should I, yeah. I'm going to bring in Julie because that 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 brings in that's my question for you, Julie. Obviously, um, you you take a you had that sort of ability to with members across the European opinion. What's your view on what the drivers are of investment in space right now? Yes. Um, hello, everyone, and thanks for inviting us, um, uh, Shane. I think you did a pretty good introduction of myself. There's not much more to say than I've been uh, working with GCC since 2016, being responsible for uh, the cold chain members in Europe um, and uh, development of the association and industry overall. Yeah, first off, uh, the cold storage uh, market is near saturated. Uh, we see average occupancy rate uh, of about 80 to 90 percent across Europe. Uh, the saturation is partially uh, caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and restrictive measures that have led to a significant um, downturn in the food service sector. Um, Matteo has touched upon the um, consumption that is increasing uh, and obviously the food producers and, and manufacturers that continue to announce um, production growth to serve that increasing uh, consumer demand. Uh, we also see international trade inten intensifying, uh, which creates an additional demand for space to be able to handle this uh, export and, and import flow. Um, and last but not least, the, the whole Brexit saga has also pushed uh, many customers to pile stocks uh, both on the European continent, or continental Europe and the UK, uh, which I'm pretty sure you are aware of. So that's more or less the broad picture yeah so 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 we've got a lot of investor confidence but we've actually got um you know this belt is built on firm foundations there are sort of much fundamental market drivers that are showing that the space is is needed um will can i ask you to come in and sort of obviously with your sort of overview of both cold storage but also the wider sort of industrial market in the uk is the cold storage market tracking the rest of the market or is it particularly is it, is it different in what ways but you're on mute will Sorry, how many times have you said that in the last 12 months? Um, <laughs> hi, thanks, Shane. So I head up the uh, development project management team at Savills, and we uh, we work for occupiers and developers delivering logistics um, and industrial space. So in terms of the the space race, there is a big race for logistics space full stop, whether that's more traditional logistics space or, or, or cold or frozen. Um, it's a it's a very very busy market, and you know the, the 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 schemes we're developing for with our clients are getting snapped up very quickly. But it does, I mean, there is an, there's definitely a a shift in the types of occupiers. Um, a lot of the schemes we're looking at, we're helping put proposals together for um, chilled or frozen occupiers. We've just finished a big. Uh, uh, unit which was which was roughly a third frozen third chilled and a third ambient um so it's 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 higher and higher up the radar all the time i think the the big there's a big difference though in terms of the construction depending on whether it's chilled or frozen on a on a chilled unit it's far easier to retrofit into an existing building but if you're if you're looking at a frozen it's far more far more built to suit. We have to look at how the how the slabs dealt with, how the how the overall insulations dealt with, and and the doors and the like. So, as I say, retrofitting in in chilled is far far easier. One of the big challenges, um, sort of outside of the sort of the various construction elements, is the power. Um, you know, we all know that the 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 UK electrical network is uh, is not the best, and that that's leading to a number of challenges so we're having to look at innovative solutions mixing uh, on-site renewables with with grid um, some schemes almost entirely on uh, on-site renewables so i think the, the the key message really is is looking at these things sooner rather than later because the the earlier you 
look to a new property, the more options there are on the table. The later it is down the line, you're you're limited, and 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 the more compromises there are. Yeah, I, mean, I think we're going to. I will unpack that a bit more in, in in the discussion. Will I think this issue of the difference between the chill logistics uh, warehousing need and how that how that market is served versus versus the frozen uh, market and how those two are, are separate. I've had a question come through about that, so I'll, I'll come back to that. But I want to bring in Sander. Sander, thank you very much for joining us. Obviously, you're our expert in in the operational side of things. Are there some sort of in terms of the dynamics of how the supply chain operates and how, how people what what what, they operate, what what businesses need from their supply chain how's that impacting do you think or how's that changing what are the implications for the types of buildings that are, that are, go, that are being constructed in the uk and across europe thank you uh, shane and thanks uh, for inviting me my name is sander de leo and i come from a place which is very difficult to pronounce for many people except for dutch people which is wageningen <laughs> so uh, and in wageningen we uh, we uh, specifically focus on studying food supply chains i'm Heading up the operations research and logistics group, which uh, amongst others uh, works on uh, cold chains and supply chains related to cold chains. So that's also the sort of the perspective that I would like to take, and not just look at the space, but rather look at what's going on in the in the in the further supply chain. And what you see is that in this cold chain supply chain, there's been a key challenge in finding sustainable alternatives to road transport because that's been a dominant mode of transport, at least in Europe. Uh, you see, for example, there's been an interest in a cold chain ra uh, rail network, cool rail uh, initiative, for example. Uh, but there are also, there's, of course, uh, uh, cross-modal uh, handling, which is limiting such multimodal initiatives. And that, I believe, will also impact uh, supply chain infrastructure in terms of location. So it's logical that, at least from a goods flow perspective, there's a lot of these new initiatives are, are for example, taking place in, in port locations, uh, just as Rotterdam, for example, that, that Matteo also referred to. Uh, what I'm also seeing is that a lot of these initiatives are focused on improving sustainability of these facilities, at least. And um, an interesting factor impacting cold, uh, cold chains is, um, it may be a, a, a bit of an unexpected one, uh, a lot of shipping companies have implemented slow sailing strategies um, to improve uh, fuel consumption. However, reefers that are on that ship also require energy. So uh, reefers are on the way longer and therefore use more energy. So there's a trade off. And interestingly, uh, that also affects multimodal trade offs, of, uh, obviously, because you could think of having those types of uh, trade offs for, for short sea shipping as well. But we're finding that at least for the shorter distances in terms of overall emissions that that trucking still is the sort of the the, the way to, uh, the way to go and i think another uh, development that is interesting at least to think of in terms of, of, of the supply chain infrastructure is uh, is remote sensing technology uh, equipped on on reefers which makes it possible to uh, make uh, or enable at least early decision making in terms of where and how to handle so that means that efficient handling in uh, terminals and in stores will become more and more important to support such agile cold chain processes rather than just the, 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 the storage. So the, the development of uh, you know, increasing the visibility on the pipeline is essential. And I also therefore believe that the type of infrastructure needed uh, will, will actually be much more sort of be able to support and facilitate these, uh, these agile supply chain processes and handling. Thank you, Sandra. That's that's a really important perspective. I think this issue of development linked to ports and international trade is a really interesting one. And I think in the UK context, I wonder if there are some specific nuances that make us slightly different to some other other markets. But nonetheless, um, partly because we're so small, I think is probably part of the, part of the reason for that. Um, in terms of geography, I mean, um, in terms of um, this issue of sustainability and the issue of what we're building today, and and the fact that's going to be the, the construction that we rely on through the next 30 years through to 2050 is an important conversation point for next the next session after the break i'm, I'm going to bring in henry henry you're you're our you're you're, you're representing the business uh, a business that is investing right now um putting its money where its mouth is so can you give us a sense of why why your business has got confidence to invest in cold sure. right now absolutely thanks shane so so as shane mentioned uh, i'm from constellation cold logistics and so we're a a platform of market leading cold logistics companies across Europe. And at the moment it comprises uh, Stock Arbor in Belgium, which Matteo mentioned. Um, we've got Lintelo in the Netherlands, uh, Glacio in Norway, and most recently um, HSH Cold Stores in the UK joined us uh, with, they've got three, three cold stores in Grimsby and one in Redditch. So 
I mean, really, our, our focus, Judy did a really good job of, of summarizing the demand-driven um, opportunity, and that's that's really our focus. Um, we're investing to support the growth of our customers. And I think that's not necessarily a massive change from what smart operators have always done in the industry. Um, they've always looked to develop capacity to meet customer demand. Uh, and I think there's definite first mover advantage there. Um, we'll talk about this this competition and and sure we want to make sure that we're able to be as responsive to that demand as we possibly can um, but it's definitely in nobody's interest to develop lots of capacity on spec uh, without committed volume uh, I think that uh, we really want to go to lengths to stress how that's certainly not the way that we're approaching the the market opportunity it needs to be incremental it needs to be in recognition of the level of demand but also the type of demand and Sandra spent time talking about how how we need to be careful about making sure that we're able to be um, uh, agile uh, based on on the specifics of the demand um, but the way that we kind of look at the market is um, it's it's probably fair to say that there's been a bit of a wave of consolidation in in cold storage, certainly in third party cold storage across Europe. Um, you could probably argue that it's maybe following five years behind what happened in, in the US. Um, but I think we could probably say that uh, while in the US, um, the model saw lots of large investors coming in, acquiring family run um, and regional operators and incorporating them into a, a corporate structure. Um, we, we we see a potential alternative route in Europe, driven really by big big differences in the business, and and one of the biggest ones is on the customer side. In the US, you've got large companies who who demand a standardized service across uh, the whole of the North American continent. Often, um, in the in Europe, we have lots of national supply chains that diminish that need for standardization. Um, and moreover, a lot of the big customers in Europe are really well served by strong family run businesses who sometimes play a really specialized role in those customer supply chains. And so our approach is really to support that interdependence, ensure that these, these strong family run businesses have access to capital to grow, support their entrepreneurial drive, encourage the next generation to come on um, and build those, those cross country networks but really um, more of the same being strong to the strong and close to the customer uh, and so we, we see those smart operators as still being the the right people to make the investment but I think I do want to spend one minute on what Matteo flagged which is this uh, the automation uh, it's yeah. which has seen real step change potential in terms of uh, efficiency and and also environmental performance which I think we're going to be talking about later um, the automation in high bays is is a fantastic opportunity, one that we're committed to in Stock Arbo. We're developing another cold, another high bay in Stock Arbo. Um, however, we 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 want to flag that they're the most visible kind of symbol of the space race, but they're not necessarily. It's not one size fits all, as Sandra said. Um, we we see that it's not always the best fit uh, if you've got kind of high touch supply chains, lots of value-added services, if you've got slow turners, if you've got a regular pallet, sometimes uh, you need to go down another path. And so um, there is a continued need for conventional cold storage. So there is a place for these smaller operators that have strong connections with customers. Um, we kind of a bit of a bit of an exclusive, we've not announced it in, in the market yet, but we're developing a, a new conventional cold store um, through HSH in Grimsby. And that's really on the back of a strong demand from our local customer base in the Humber region. They want storage there, but it needs to be flexible based on the um, the business profile there. It's it made sense for us. It's a better fit for us to go conventional. So, in summary, kind of investment Thank needs you. to be prudent, and that's really our approach. Thank you, Henry. That's great. And I think you've really sort of answered the sort of my immediate thought was this difference between the automated sort of stand. You think automation? You think standardized and large scale? And then you think non-automated, smaller scale. Is that is that really the profile of things, Sander? From your point of view, do you think that that automated warehousing fulfillment operations are all about big, standardised, and for the future, or are there ways in which automation can help at that kind of more small-scale, responsive, 
servicing things like last mile fulfillment and things like that? Well, you see that uh, in the past, a lot of the automation is focused on bulk storage, but these days automation is much more uh, actually gone to, to the actual picking. If you see what, what is happening with dry goods and where automation is supporting, it's mainly the picking processes. Uh, and therefore, I think and the, the, the types of developments that have been going on specifically there, I think would be excellent to, uh, uh, to be applied and most likely are applied already in, in, in cold chain warehouses. So um, to facilitate these small scale uh, uh, handling uh, activities. But from a point of view of investor confidence, Matteo, the more complicated it gets, is that is that better or worse? If you're thinking about sort of in general investment terms, you know, in terms in terms of sort of high end, innovative, untried automation to, to to do sort of the more complicated stuff, is that is that a good investment bet or not? I don't just, I don't know. Well, um, the market. It, you know the, the consumption of the good that goes into those those warehouses is growing so there is there is a confidence from that point of view the problem there is that when you build uh, uh, an high bay automated warehouse the value of the warehouse it's in what's inside not just the box outside and and th this brings a problem of inseparability sometimes of the two so you cannot uh, uh, repurpose easily that that warehouse and, and this is a problem that uh, uh, from our perspective we we have been encountering when when talking to uh, to companies that wanted to that wanted to invest so there is uh, uh, a trade-off in that and and of course uh, it costs more money per pallet to to build a, a, an automated warehouse it takes longer time so there are there are of course uh, uh, negative trade-offs uh, all comes down to the client base that you have, what kind of client you have, how many clients can you anchor before even starting the operation, and how much you leave for them uh, uh, in uh, in your in your um, annual pallet movements or or, or storage uh, volumes, and of course the role of the of the small ones that maybe are from local producer or more uh, 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 smaller food and agri uh, uh, businesses. So that mix uh, has to be careful considered and has to be put, of course, uh, uh, against the, the, the total investment and the fact that from a financing institution, you have this problem of having to deal with this uh, uh, warehouse for the next 30 years. And of course, uh, uh, you know, there is a risk to, to, to be managed in, uh, in repurposing it, which is much easier for, uh, for dry or even passing, as uh, Will said, uh, from dry to, to, to chill, uh, for example. But if you have a frozen uh, uh, um, warehouse, uh, which deals with frozen products, it's much more uh, uh, difficult to, to, to move from there. And, and of course, the cost of dismantling are, are really high and uh, you have to consider all this uh, uh, back and forth. Will, can I ask you that? So that, that's a good point. And something that people already mentioned in the, plat in the platform and, um, is, is about this point about having the confidence to make an investment, to build something, particularly build to suit, which obviously is still feels like the dominant thing in cold chain, having those sort of customer relationships in place. I mean, how is, how's your, what's your, te talking to the customer the, the developments and the potential developments, the uh, partners that you do, um, how much do you, how much do you feel, there's a, what, what is the nature of people's confidence that they have got those sort of long long term relationships that they can have in place to have the confidence to make these kinds of new build investments how how is it how, what's the situation with that right now i suppose it, you know it, it, as you say it, it depends on the relationships it depends on uh, the, the 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 most important word which is the covenant mm -hmm. and and understanding you know what 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 that company's aspirations are um you know somebody's already mentioned uh, you know, the, the, I think it was Matteo talked about the, the amount of investment that goes into the building, um, you know, the, the fitting it out, putting the box in, putting all the, 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 the mechanical and if you go as far as the automation as well, significant. You know, there's, there's an enormous um, investment there from, from an occupier's perspective. So I think, you know, the more that's being done in there gives you more confidence that they're necessarily going to be there for longer. Um, but, you know, it's, it's understanding what, what that, that that model is, but also looking at how much you're adapting the building. So if from a, a developer investor perspective, you're building a relatively institutional building that the occupier is coming along and modifying, that you can convert back to a 
traditional logistics building, there's a lot more confidence. The more bespoke that building is, and the more unusual, if that's the right word, the building will be at the end of the lease, the more of a difficult decision it is. And then all of those different different factors come into play. So it's, it, it's yeah, it, it, it's a real balance of, of all those things, I think. Brilliant. Um, okay, we're gonna take a pause, and we're gonna bring in um, one of our partners for today's session now, and we're gonna, so it's the end of part one, so um, so please, if I ask my panelists to, to take a five minute break, um, get a glass of water, whatever, and then we'll bring you back. Um, and then we're going to bring in um, our friends from Société, Société Development Axe Nor. Um, Thomas, um, are you there with us? Yes, good morning. Hello, Thomas, good to see you. Hello, hello. Um, um, so thank you very much for supporting today's event. We really appreciate it. I know you're going to talk about a very interesting development um not in the uk but very very close to the uk and i think particularly well, one of the things we're going to talk about in the next panel is the issues around brexit and the changing nature of supply chains on the back of the changes to uk's position in the single market and i think the development you're talking about has a is very much related to that so um let me let me um pull up your slides um can you see those yeah i do okay brilliant okay yeah, thanks almost over to you yeah, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you for, for the, your last question because it's, it's a nice introduction uh, for the, what I'm going to present because we're talking about investment, uh, cold chain, cold storage, and automatization with the challenge that we know. So let me introduce Zdan. Uh, so, um, so just before, I would just take a, say one word about Stan. Uh, so Stan means uh, Société de Développement de l'Action Nord, means uh, um, uh, North Axis Development Company. It has been created in 2018 by Julien Delapiz, which is the current CEO, with a strong focus on real estate for logistics, innovation, and efficiency. And when we're talking about efficiency, we can talk about automatization and cold storage. Yeah, if you can, let me show you the second slide, which is very important and uh, taking you, you, your attention on it because that's the project. It's uh, a big building of 60,000 pallets of capacity divided by sales because as I understood just previously, that's sometimes some challenges behind that. So, it's the, the best available technology right now. It's completely automatized. The permit and the financing are already validated, but we decide not to develop the, the warehouse in gray or white because we want to adapt everything inside for the customers. Because as we know, the operation is the key point. And on top of that, every, no, nothing is standardized, especially in this area. So, as you can see in this picture, and let me emphasize this because it's very important and very unique, it's only 100 meters from the terminals. And it's located in Dunkerque. And you know, sometimes in France, we have something called strikes. And I think it, uh, it's very important and impacting uh, recently the activity in the port. But during the last 30 years, no strike happened in Dunkerque because it's a strong uh, social union agreement between the current union and the port authorities. So that's uh, when we get the, the black uh, days for the French port, Dunkerque was able to attract more, uh, uh, more volumes based on that. So if you can, just one word in the next slide, is showing the place Dunkerque. I'm pretty sure that everyone knows where Dunkerque is, but it's very centralized north of Europe, very close of UK and Ireland. And that's why we are here and we wanted to become member of Cold Chain Association, because for us, it's very important to create a link between Dunkerque and UK and Ireland. And in the next slide, I will explain why. But just let me show you the, the just one section, <laughs> uh, the, the importance of uh, the connection. So uh, Dunkerque gets very strong network in terms of highways, strong network in terms of barge and uh, rail connections. is very located. is is the perfect place to to uh, for for a uh, European distribution center in Europe. Here we go. The the next slide and the reason why we are here. Dunkerque 
is uh, can impact really the be a Brexit solution for all the uh, English and Irish uh, industrials because uh, Dunkerque put everything in place uh, to streamline the process for customs with a digital customs portal. Uh, we Dunkerque is the third European port for TC, so that's creating fluidity and flows process. And on top of that, we are having sanitary and phytosanitary uh, um, controls. But look just one sec the map because it's just amazing. On a daily basis, we are having plenty of different connections and all the different dots and lane are the daily connection from Dunkirk to UK and Ireland. So we can provide a certain reactivity in terms of pre and post carriage. That, that's why uh, hopefully uh, Dunkirk can be a European DC solution for, for you guys. And the next slide, we don't, don't have uh, chain if you can just change on the other slide. Uh, no, the piece before. We yeah. missed the slide, sorry. Yeah, the fifth, the fifth one. Yeah, okay. so, yeah. and of course, uh, Dunkirk can provide a short sea connection for north of Europe, but as well south of Europe, as you can see on the map for with uh, Spain, uh, Portugal, Maghreb. And the last slide, it's uh, clearly uh, Dunkirk is a deep sea uh, transoceanic port with different uh, connections all over the world on a daily and weekly basis. So everything to say that uh, we know the challenge of building a, a strong, uh, uh, very big uh, platform, uh, cold, cold storage, uh, autom automated uh, warehouse in Dunkirk, but we believe that we can uh, attract customers in Dunkirk. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thomas, and thank you very much for supporting the event. Um, in terms of in terms of uh, this issue, obviously, we're going to ask the panel about this in a moment. But I'm going to ask you first. The obviously, it's very early days in the UK not being in the single market anymore. But I think it's already pretty clear that businesses are food businesses are get are making are understanding that it's not a paperwork problem; it's a structure of their supply chains problem that they're going to have to challenge to deal with in the coming months and years. Um, what extent are people talking to you about the opportunity to sort of hold stock, sort of, you know, have a sort of staging post on the northern France to um, to, um, uh, to, to, to to be able to be able to service the UK market or the Irish market? Or I mean, is there a sense yet of where, where the main priority or main opportunity is for, for an operator at, 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 at that location? Yeah, you know, that, that, that's a great question. Thank you, Shane. Uh, that's quite important to say that it's, again, an innovative approach. And when we uh, starting a conversation with people in the food and beverage F FMCGs, uh, they, they are a little bit astonished about why we are offering Dunkerque. But if we see the uh, partnership uh, created by uh, DFDS on, uh, uh, and the connection from Dunkerque to Rosla on a daily basis, we having so many volumes uh, on a daily basis. We counting uh, three to five hundred trucks just crossing Dunkirk to going to Roslav, and, and just showing just the, the the international flows that we having. So of course it's innovative. We need to to explain the reason why, uh, but the the transportation network allows a strong reactivity. Brilliant. Thomas, thank you very much. Um, so hopefully everyone's got a sense of the opportunity that there is available. The contact details for, Max, for Thomas and Maxime are available there on the slide. Obviously, we can also introduce you if you would like that. We're also planning to do a, sort of a more bespoke session about this, this development with Estan in, uh, in, in, coming, in coming weeks, and we'll advertise that to, to you all. So Thomas, thank you very much for now. Um, and um, we will um, bring our panel back in, um, if that's OK. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you for for coming back. There we go, brilliant. Um, I'm gonna carry on, I'm gonna dive straight in and carry on from that sort of theme, which is this issue of the Brexit effect. And maybe Julie, sorry to jump on, jump. I did, I'm conscious that uh, you're next in terms of the person I need to speak to. Um, can you have a sort of any thoughts on whether you're seeing yet from the conversations you're having with members across, across Europe about what the Brexit effect might be in terms of the interactions between the European 
logistics market and, your, and, and cold chain infrastructure and the UK? Yeah, I've heard mostly that uh, at the time Brexit was implemented, it created a lot of hiccups and bottlenecks, uh, but it seems to be going away uh, slowly. However, uh, paperwork and uh, sanitary checks are still, you know, kind of challenging in terms of um, quantity handling the volume of, of um, trade flows. So. Um, yeah, and then some customers are looking for different supply chain models or structure, or redesigning their strategy uh, for their products. So I think it's a bit early uh, yet to say, you know, that the, the real impact of, of Brexit, but definitely in the first steps, it's, it's been a, an administrative burden uh, for many. Um, and I heard also from... Uh, uh, some of our members in in Ireland and Northern Ireland that is creating some kind of issues which we are, you are probably much more aware of uh, than yeah yeah, I've, yeah it's, it's been dominating my life for the last year and a half but um Henry for your point of view obviously from the point of view of your sort of investment strategies and the like was has Brexit been a course correction or has it been not, had not registered what 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 sort of been the sort of impact of of the last few months on on how you've seen your, your the, the plans that you've outlined for the for the business. I mean, for us, sometimes it's exactly as Julie said. I think that there, there's been a, a degree of Brexit stockpiling that is is, is dissipating somewhat, um, but it's sometimes a little bit difficult to unpick the impact of COVID-19 um, with, with Brexit. We still we still see quite a high stockholding uh, from our customers, and part of it could be this continued need to hold stock closer to point of consumption as opposed to adopting just-in-time supply chains from from Europe and, and part of it could just be simply a lot of this food service still not moving as rapidly as it used to. Um, I think for, for us our, our focus in the UK is predominantly for, for UK consumption and so mm -hmm. it's it's not so much of an impact however we do see some opportunity actually. Um, Sondra suggested that short sea is not yet the solution in Europe but we see some potential there as, as people look to take um, some trucks off the roads and reduce their dependence on the Dover Calais um, corridor, and uh, there could potentially be short sea opportunities through ports such as Immingham, which uh, which yeah. suits our network. Absolutely, yeah, totally. Sandra, I'm going to sort of broaden that out and ask you a question about sort of. I think you touched on it a bit in your first answer, but may in, just in the first session, but maybe sort of to drill into it a bit more. Um, can you talk a bit about the, 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 the we, whenever we talk about warehousing development, we also talk about the Amazon effect and we talk about online delivery and online fulfillment as the kind of main driver of the changing nature of the warehousing we need. Is it as simple as that? Is that the same in sort of food chain as well? Is it essentially the online, the restructuring of what needs to get from where to where that's driving the, the change in the space that we're occupying and building in, in, in across markets in Europe? Yeah. Uh, that's that's an indeed a very good question, Shane. Uh, thanks. I think um, let, let me let me broaden it up a, a, a little bit. Um, uh, I think that that uh, an interesting development that, that I observe among among retailers, uh, but actually also a bit among among processes is is they're, they're thinking for some categories more in terms of trade-offs between what do I deliver frozen and what do I deliver fresh. So and sometimes these things are also affected by events just like COVID for example with prawns you all of a sudden had to freeze them because there was no capacity anymore to uh, uh, to actually peel them. There was no possibility to transport them to Morocco. Uh, same happens with with meat, for example, and that's actually an interesting thing we we, we found. Retailers can buy uh, fresh meat directly from the slaughterhouse. Uh, they can also buy that meat that has been frozen and and is being thawed afterwards. We as consumers typically don't know that, but some retailers have a requirement that they say, you know, we want to have only fresh meat. The others say we don't mind. And what I believe is that you know for, because of uh, events such as what we've been through, uh, this mix is becoming more and more important. This may also facilitate you know, growth in specific markets like online retail. So uh, obviously the more freezing capacity, uh, the frozen items you want to deliver, the more capacity you may actually uh, require. And that's something that I think is going to happen more and more, this sort of flexibility, which is important also for organizing the upstream supply chain, uh, uh, that, that they'll be calling upon that. Now going back to the issue of, of online uh, home delivery of food, and that 
that's an interesting one because it's grown tremendously, particularly as a result of COVID last year. Yet online retailers have had difficulties making a profit. I mean, if you look at Ocado, for example, they still pro uh, they still uh, reported a 44 million loss over last year, that's despite the enormous rise uh, due to COVID. So apparently this is a very challenging market. The question, of course, is, is whether a different cold chain structure is required to make that profitable. I, I'm, I, I don't really think so, because I think that the, the, the challenges really are and how to organize uh, the, the last mile, and because that's a very, very important thing. And yes, cold chain is important, but um, uh, it, it's, it's, I don't think it's really driving that. Uh, if I may, another point that, that I think is also something to take into account is uh, we've, we've observed an imbalance in reefers across the world. Uh, and that actually will impact uh, not only just the prices. I mean, there have been shipping companies asking surcharges for uh, just transporting reefers. It may actually affect the quality you may, cho may choose from, whether it's a new one or, or an older one, for example. But it will definitely start to affect trade flows. Uh, and, uh, that, and that is something to take into account also when deciding on cold chain locations uh, in particular. You don't want to be in, air, in an area where reefers are hard to come by. Uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. No, thank you, thank you for that. I think like, this issue of 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 how online, how culture, how the drivers for cold chain investment and the online thing, I think they are not the same as the sort of Amazon effect for for for, for non food. I think there's a very there are a nuances difference in there. Not least because actually the sort of fulfillment seems to operate operate best from supermarkets still, apart from the very specific Ocado type operations. Um, well, um, I'm going to ask you. Um, basically, we, we talked about a bit in the last session, but I'm going to sort of, sort of drill in on it a bit more. Um, this issue of, of and actually I'm going to ask you about specifically the difference between people who are building logistics operations or, or looking to expand their logistics operations to service the market as a sort of third party logistics operator versus those that are looking to service the market as as, as, as private for their own needs within, within the, say, the supermarket network or whatever else. Do you, in terms of that build to suit and that kind of how we see that market opportunity, are there differences of dynamic in that as well, as well as um, as well as some of the things we talked about um, in the last session? Yeah, well, I think you know, according to our uh, our research, about uh, up until quite recently, sort of two thirds of, of of the cold distribution has been two thirds has been built to suit, approximately. Um, and but there, there does this. It feels as though there's it's becoming a shift where it's 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 less of that and it's more taking occupation of of either uh, buildings that are already in construction um, or or actually completed. And I don't think that's out of choice. I think that's just out of necessity. The 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 issues with a build to suit um, if occupiers operators want to do it for themselves it's very difficult to find the land the majority of land that's that, that's suitable that's allocated that's that's got anything like the right amount of power are largely um controlled by developers already and uh, for obvious reasons the developers want to keep hold of that land and uh, and do what they do with it the and if you go down a build to suit route with a developer um it's obviously there's, there's time time constraints around it time challenges um uh, if it's you know the more bespoke the building is, the more challenges there are around planning and the actual delivery. So it, it, where we're seeing occupiers going into existing buildings, even if you know newly completed or ones that are you know signing agreement for leases on buildings that are about to start, it, it, it largely feels as though it's because they need it quickly. Yes. And if you need to be occupying the building within probably 18 to 24 months, then doing a very bespoke build to suit is, uh, is, you know, you're going to be right up against it in terms of timing. So uh, that the, the the pressure on how quickly you need it, and in most instances, occupiers are wanting these things very very quickly. Um, it's it's looking at the compromises um, on a, on an existing building, and you know, going to the table with a build to suit obviously has has lots of advantages you get a building that's far better tailored to you you've got a bigger um you, you've got a better set of cards in your hand if you like when it's uh, when you're negotiating how bespoke you want that building and and equally as importantly how how much you need to reinstate it at the end so i suppose you know given given the perfect scenario everyone would do a build to suit 
but as I say, timing dictates that that, that doesn't always work. So, so, so the build to so 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 moving building that taking that sort of theme on onto it to the next step next step, which is the fact that it's very striking to me. Someone said it to me a sort of a couple of months ago, and I sort of re it's really resonating with me now. And every time I think about these issues, I see it in this context. The, the warehouses we're building today, say they have about 30 years life, roughly, maybe more than that, maybe slightly less, they will be operating in 2050. Well, the UK government has legislated to make the the, 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 the the UK economy will net zero by 2050. So are the buildings we're building today the right buildings that are going to be able to handle a net zero economy in 2050? Now, that's not the question I'm going to ask because that's a bit of a difficult one to answer. But can I ask you, Henry, to sort of talk about the issue of investment drivers around those ESG type considerations. I mean, how important is that in securing finance and getting confidence in projects? Is that really a factor or not? And I, th I find it hard to pin down whether it is in terms of the genuine, because of that point Will was just making about that immediate need and servicing the immediate need of your network today, rather than necessarily thinking about the next sort of 20, 30 years. Got it. And, and so short answer is yes, it's it's imperative. And, uh, and, and secondly, I don't necessarily see it's always in conflict, that speed versus ESG. But our um, but now ESG considerations have become a, like a business imperative, really, uh, and so everything we do is heavily influenced by by looking for ESG improvements. Um, we're backed by a uh, a European infrastructure investor called Arcus, and they've always prioritised ESG reporting, and uh, we participate in annual Gresby reporting, which is the the global benchmark for for e for um, for real assets and it's it's kind of at the heart of everything we do and so we've invested enormously in in solar for example that's on all of our roofs in belgium the netherlands and the uk we only use um 100 renewable energy in norway um the, the new store that we're building in grimsby for example will be bram certified um as is is some of our buildings in in the netherlands and we're always looking for enhancements and so while while we have to put up the shell uh, today looking forward to 30 years in our crystal ball we can't necessarily tell what we'll need to do but we can we can constantly improve and so with our existing infrastructure we're always looking for improvements in lighting and in doors in insulation anything we can do to be more efficient with this with energy consumption while at the same time looking for for uh, generation opportunities and then there's kind of the it's, it's probably important to think about the the multimodal impacts as well and so the connections we can provide plugins for reefers and exploring anything fleet related that reduces our dependence on on fossil fossil fuels and so our fleet is all all euro six obviously but then look at okay we're moving away perhaps from from diesel for uh, for for reefer power but i think we're at the beginning of a really long journey and we've got lots more to do uh, but i think that is so long as we do embrace these technological advances that are, are being made all the time, then uh, the, the existing infrastructure can sometimes uh, accommodate those improvements. Thanks, Henry. That's really useful. Matteo, from your point of view, can you isolate ESG motivations as a driver in themselves of investment in cold chain, or is it just uh, one part of the mix? I think that <clears throat> ESG is one part of the drivers that we're seeing in the market now. and it's maybe it has a double function it's a driver and an opportunity in the sense that we see three for the future and sustainability in, in, in logistics and in particular in, in cold chain there is a role for the regulators <clears throat> and uh, of course the european union is at the forefront uh, on regulating uh, uh, energy consumption energy efficiency but is always intervening you know the green deal is a list of long a long list of reforms that will a touch upon almost every every aspect of the of the economic life and and you know inside of it for example there is a sustainable mobility initiative and they plan to reduce 90 uh, percent of the emission by 2050 there is the farm to fork strategy uh, for greener uh, uh, supply chains which is still broadly how we will operate but of course cold chain and, and food the food the logistic will be will be part of it and then has been mentioned by by my fellow panelists the, the targets in 2050 the zero net emission and so on so pressure will come from there uh, both in terms of what path the industry will follow and also the daily activity if we think about as henry uh, 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 mentioned how do you manage your track fleet how do you fuel your track fleet uh, and, and not to talk about 
uh, going back to what Sander was saying about the online and the last mile problem you mentioned, Shane, the fact that in the future in the city centers, there will be a, a zero emission policy. So you will have to completely switch your, uh, the way you, you, you propel your, uh, your, uh, uh, your trucks going to hydrogen, electric and so on. And, and this is a big uh, uh, issue at the moment, for example, in, uh, here in the Netherlands. And then we have another point, which is the pressure from fruit producers, that they want greener, leaner supply chains. Uh, examples can range from packaging to, to logistics, uh, of what Nestle is doing, what Unilever is doing, but also, let's say, uh, of a smaller caliber in terms of volume, Avico in the, in the potato business is trying to, to, to operate on that. Everybody's looking now that their sourcing is taken care of some, somehow through the uh, their farms and their and their cow breeders and their pork breeders, they now look at the rest of the supply chain and this will be a factor. What is being called the scope three emission will, will, will be will be a, a, an important point and and will be uh, important in the future. In all this, the ESG, of course, uh, has its uh, constraints to enter that uh, stream of, uh, of, uh, of uh, investments. But it's also an opportunity if the company plans well their future and they show results and they have a reporting system and they act, <clears throat> you know, towards the, the reduction of their emission. Of course, there is a logic to attract more investments for, uh, from that side. And as a research group, we're going to tackle this at the, at the end of the year specifically for, uh, for cold chain and to see which instruments huh, are the better and what are the homework that uh, some of the companies or, 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 or uh, the sector has, uh, has to do. Well, it sounds, it sounds like we need to need to hear a bit more about that when you when you when you publish that, Matteo. So we'll be I'll be yeah. knocking on your door for that. Julie, can you can you sort of give a sense? What was your impression of the pull and push factors on this? To what extent do you think that these these sort of environmental sustainability considerations in building new cold storage will be enforced through the current and future potential regulation on a pan-European basis, or are they being driven by consumer? consumer demand by that by the customers with their with their demands of what they expect to see in their supply chains because of their customer facing obligations well what, what we see generally is that uh, the new buildings tend to be more much more focused on uh, sustainability building sustainable facilities uh, taking energy efficiency into consideration because it's one of the major costs for a, a cold store operators uh, using renewable uh, energy, having more careful considerations for the refrigeration system that they will use. Um, and they are also um, looking at reaching higher operational efficiency. So um, all sorts of considerations that are uh, contrasting with the traditional uh, conventional buildings that we used to have 30 years ago. Um, also the cold storage business has developed tremendously in the past decade or a few decades towards a more value-added services oriented business uh, than just a commodity storage uh, model. So the model of the building uh, need also to be adapted to the type of services that, that the operator is offering. And then at the Thank same you. time, we see that the insurance market has an influence on building considerations. Uh, because they have stricter and stricter considerations, um, for instance, with regard to fire prevention. So uh, builders and, and operators building look at more performing material, um, just as an example. So they are taking those considerations in, in terms of what systems they're going to use to make sure it complies with the insurance uh, requirements. Um, and of course, Automation, as it was mentioned previously, continues to become more and more popular. Uh, however, like um, um, uh, Henry uh, said, um, um, not one size fits all. It all depends on the business model. Um, Sander talked about automated picking. It's definitely existing, but not broadly uh, implemented in the cold stores uh, yet. Uh, that's something that people are looking at. but. Uh, there are many ways of having automation in, in your uh, cold store. It's not only high bay automated building, it can be different types of automation, uh, automated uh, racking systems or AGVs and different types of automation that serves your business model in, in the best way. Yeah, thank you. Sa Sander, Matteo made the point there about the fact that 
you know, cities, and this is something I recognize and I think is a very much, a, anyone operating in the UK market has to be alive to the, to the way in which movement of freight is going to be restricted in the years, in the coming years. This idea of zero emissions into cities and the idea of basically regulation forcing changes to last mile operations in cities and the like, how do you foresee that impacting on, again, the physical infrastructure of where, 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 where our supply chains are located? Yeah, so what, um, what you see, the reason for, for me for saying that there's not so much effect on retail is that it's not specifically cold chain, but yes, it's broader because those things apply to dry goods, any goods basically you want to bring into the city. So uh, zero emission vehicles that go into the city are, are becoming more and more uh, the norm um, here in the Netherlands. Uh, we're a bicycling country, so you see that a lot of the parcel deliveries is taking place and, and you know, even deliveries, other deliveries by means of cargo bikes. So you see indeed that other means of transport are, are, are being required. And I would say it's particularly the regulatory push that, that does, that, that does um, um, affect these changes uh, because consumers don't require them. Retailers are not well; they 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 would not be, or uh, any any stores in the in the in the city would not be requiring them either. It's a regulatory push that leads to these. So that's something that governments are absolutely thinking about very carefully. That also means that you know, most likely around the city you will uh, need to have some form of a hub from which you will uh, uh, then transport into the city. Uh, uh, with 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 or, or that might even be slower transports that go to the side of the city, a big truck from where you have smaller maybe electrical vehicles that make short milk type of routes into the city for uh, for their local uh, deliveries. So that that is what what companies are actually and, and here in the city where I live, you already see that happening. It's in Utrecht where you see these small electrical vehicles already for deliveries to the stores. So yes, absolutely, a, a regulatory push is key. Yeah, that frame. I, I think I, I fully sort of agree with that. Um, I've got a really good question here, which this feels like a massive topic that unfortunately I don't think we can spend a lot of time on, which is the, um, but I might ask you just quickly, Matteo, for a couple of words on it. Um, and I've noticed this as well. The diff there, are, there, are, there are clearly a, the issue of whether you're insourcing or outsourcing your, your, um, your, your supply chain. If you're in a retail operation or whatever, a big retail operation, the extent to which you want to take control and own your supply chain, your warehousing and your vehicles and the like, or you're look, looking to work with a long-term 3PL partner. And I've noticed that someone like an XPO, big members of the Cold Chain Federation, have you know, developed a number of new contracts recently with some of the big retailers to provide sort of wholly integrated services for, uh, for retailers. I mean, how much of that is, you know, how much is that a feature, a permanent feature, do you think, of, of, the, of, of investment trends for the next, well, for the, next, for, for, for the future? I think we have to make a division uh, in the sense that the food supply chain is divided in two parts, if you want. One is from production to distribution center or, or owned by the retailer or, or by the provider. And the other is from the distribution center to the shops or mm. to the, the final delivery. These two worlds, uh, uh, let's say, have, have seen two different way of going about the outsourcing. A lot is happening between production and, and, and let's say, first step of distribution. And here I'm thinking of I don't know, milk, uh, dairy, for example, I'm thinking about uh, all the work has been done in fresh produce and so on. So this is something that is a high level of outsourcing already. Now we, we have to move on the other side and, and, and think about from distribution to the final shop or to the, the, the final consumers, the restaurants and whatever it is. And there is a logic there maybe uh, uh, for, a, for a new wave of, uh, of outsourcing. Uh, of course, it's as Sander uh, said, it's everything. It's not just uh, just food, um, in the sense that retailer moves moves dry and 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 food alike. Uh, probably being a specialized company, uh, doing that uh, helps. Having a knowledge of how the cold chain system helps and how the you know edge of the technology there is uh, is going. For example, it's the news of this week, the, the first warehouses, and let's look a little bit on the US, the first warehouses that Tocado built for Kroger have been into stream in the US, and they manage the e-distribution for, uh, for Kroger. Will this model be, be, be applied in Europe in the coming years? I don't know, in the sense at this point, uh, the retailers have a firm hand on their uh, e-distribution because they basically have a network of 
hidden warehouses or, or dark warehouses in the cities and they just can connect it with the with the trucks so the situation is completely different uh, from the us but i think that as if e-commerce grows, e-grocery grows uh, as much as in the US, there will be uh, uh, a problem, as we have seen in other parts of the food supply chain, of having to have a business that is, you know, the core business, it's not selling stuff, but it's moving stuff, and 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 um, and that might might spark a little bit of uh, of outsourcing uh, in the in the coming years. Uh, but yeah, COVID changed all this, and then you know, as as Julie said, uh, the situation is 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 changing, and we have to interpret it uh, as we go at the moment. Think about Brexit, think about everything else. So yes, there might be a wave of outsourcing, but we have to see how how the the system resettles uh, after all this uh, scrambling around of 2020. Thank thank you, Matteo. So oh, Julie, yes. And if I just may add a, a comment that what we see in Europe is, for instance, there is a strong integration by retailers, especially in the south of Europe, and mostly Spain and Portugal, so that, you know, uh, creates competition for the three PLs, but it, we don't see that that much in the northern parts of Europe or Western. So geographical, cultural difference may, may have an influence on the strategy as well. Thank you. I'm very... Sorry, I'm very, I'm very conscious that we're talking we, 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 a massive topic, and we scratched the surface of loads of issues and haven't got into detail on any of them. So that's unfortunately a function of some of the format. So um, please, everyone, follow up with your thoughts. I'm really interested. We'll, we'll, this is a topic we'll come back to in in, in other, another fora. Um, so I'm, I'm going to sort of a sort of wrap up question, which I'm going to see, ask the same question and ask you all for a very brief kind of sort of perspective on it, um, um, which is. You know, no, I think we've assumed. I think the assumption of the conversation is that there has been, there is a space race going on. There is a, a wave of construction happening, which is, uh, you know, very, very uh, exciting and dynamic right now. Is it a bubble, and is it a bubble that could burst or or not? That's my kind of. It's a very negative question, but you know, I'm sure you'll turn it into positive. Um, maybe um, Henry, can I start? Can I start with you? Sure. Um... Our approach is very much it's uh, that, that it's a correction, and so we're uh, at the moment, as Julie said, facilities are saturated. There's demand growth due to a number of factors, and so we're we're investing for that. Um, there have been some some investments where it's not been so obvious who the who the customer base is that they're they're supporting, um, and and we just want to to try and encourage everybody to to steer away from such speculative investments. Mm -hmm. Will, what's your view on that? In terms of in terms of the, the, the pace of, of, of growth that's happening right now, I mean, it's great from a real estate point of view. Yeah, I mean, as, as we've said, the, the growth is there across across the, the, the wider logistics sector. Um, I don't I don't think it's uh, it, it's a bubble because, the, you know, the, the people's um, habits are changing. And I think that's been accelerated by uh, by the uh, events of the last sort of 12 18 months but i think the key is, is is looking at the flexibility so you know if 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 an element of the the wider sector becomes more prominent or less prominent the building and it you know comes back to sustainability the more flexible the buildings are the more sustainable they are because they've got a longer use so if somebody comes out somebody different can go in without spending you know commercially lots of money but from a from an ESG perspective, you know, lots of lots of wasted embodied carbon. Sandra, do you do you do you, do you feel optimistic about the wave of, of construction and activity that's going on within supply chain um, right now? Yes, I do. And uh, referring to what I said earlier, I think um, I particularly holds for the for the freezing capacity. It's a way to sort of deal with imbalances in your supply chain. So I think that's this trade-off between fresh and frozen. Will be more on the on the radar of of retailers and other uh, you know, entities in the supply chain because in agri-food supply chains uh, the, um, there's long delays. So if I decide to put you know to to put a seed in the ground right now, I will have you know that affects my goods flows in six nine months from now. The same holds for for hatching. Uh, in in uh, in a uh, good chicken, for example. Mm -hmm. So what you find is that you know, and that's a simple logistics principle. If I have capacity so, to sort of uh, catch that imbalance, I might uh, I, I may be able to postpone specific uh, decisions. And I think that's a very good strategy. Yeah, Absolutely. Thank so you. thank you. Okay, then. So Matteo and Julie, over to you for your Matteo. Can you want to go first, and then Julie can have. We'll have the last word. Ladies first. 
Or, or no, if you want to leave the word to the last ladies, I'm yeah, cornered. I don't know. Okay, I'll leave, uh, I don't think it's a bubble. I think that uh, consumption is there. The consumption growth is there. Frozen food, fresh food, trade, uh, north south in Europe, and uh, um, uh, uh, and also of course. Uh, um, South, North, and North, South are, are both relevant, and uh, an element uh, of, of 2020 is the switch from just in time to just in case. Uh, people have been uh, um, not woke up, but you know, surprised by the fragility of some of the global supply chains, and they didn't want to see uh, those kind of problems. Uh, so I think that you know. It's not a bubble. There is a, will be a little bit of substitution, so not the whole new capacity will be added up. There will be also other capacity that will go, of course, uh, out because it's old, because it's uh, it's not uh, serving maybe a specific need. Uh, although there is there is room for uh, for uh, uh, local and, and smaller operation, but no, I don't see uh, I don't see it as a bubble. I see it as a readjustment, as as has been said. One of the things I do in these seminars is look for quick phrases I can then steal and make my own. And just in time to just in case is now mine. So thank you, Mathieu, for that. Um, Julie, over to you. Yes, then I want to look at the more global picture. Yeah. I don't see the population decreasing in the next years, and I think it's only increasing. Uh, so needs for additional food consumption uh, is only about to grow. Also, we see some emerging markets, emerging regions uh, becoming more mature in terms of cold chain. So I can only see that that will, you know, make the cold chain business globally grow in the future. And that could create additional flows of international trade coming into Europe and going out of Europe to those new places um, and other markets where you see the population uh, improving their um, um, a buying power and becoming more and more interested in exotic um, uh, products that for them Europe is exotic so and and both ways actually so I don't see that it's I don't think it's a bubble and I can only see that the volumes will increase in the future and thank so you, the need for space yes. thank you thank you I think that's a really good good point to end on with the panel on which is the this issue that um, the fundamentals, the reason why there is this growth is on the fundamentals, which is what we started with, and I think that's a great point to close with. So thank you very much. Thank you to all, all, all five of you for your, for your participation in today's panel. I find it really, really interesting and delighted with the amount of interaction we've had in terms of questions and stuff, which we'll follow up on. Um, thank you all for that. Um, so um, if I, um, I'm going to bring in our, our other partner for today's event, which is Dexian um, Materials Handling. So thank you all very much. If you want to uh, turn your slides off, thanks uh, for your time. Sure. And I ask David Shepard to join me. Hello, Indeed. David. Thank you very. Hi, hi, David. So you've been patiently watching and living for all of that. So I'm going to give you. And uh, um, thank you very much to to your cup to you for for helping us lay on this event today. Um, what uh, what's your sort of thoughts on? We can tell us a bit about Dexia, and then also you know what your thoughts are on what you've heard and how that impacts on the material handling uh, opportunities. Uh, a, a very interesting hour and a bit, really. So thank you for that. Um, not as a sales exercise, I've actually been involved in you know, material handling world since 1946, I think was the first product. So if it comes in a box, if it comes on a pallet, we've probably stored it somewhere around the world at, at some time. Um, uh, and yes, the world is changing, really. And I think it's a really, really interesting uh, last hour. Um, food and food logistics, food supply, we all know has been tested horribly in the last 12 months. Um, but 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 things to consider really from our side, keeping it pretty holistic rather than product specific. The key thing I think, as the person that's going to build the store, is really understand what your dream is for that store as a start point. What do you what would you ideally want it to do? And then it's involved the people, like whether it be your savills, whether it be your con your, your other contractors, and your materials handling provider then involve us in trying to create that dream for you so if we start at where you really really want to be there probably is going to be some compromises and we've talked about those compromises through the morning it could be speed to market you might have to go to an existing building rather than a, a, a build to suit you might have to go 
to a building that's slightly too big, slightly too small, you may not want to get the investment for a fully um, automated lights out, you know, conveyor in, conveyor out system. You may not have the confidence or the contracts in place, but start with a dream, get your partners involved in the process. Yeah, and that's yeah. in, you know, in the end, this industry revolves around pallets, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Things turn up in containers on lorries out of factories in warehouses. We might take them off the pallets inside it, we might stack them all outside and rebox, rebrand, repick, break down to grid, all of those lovely things. But this is all about pallets in, pallets out, goods in, goods out, and what we do with it to give us the agility and give us the efficiencies that we all need with all the drivers for the market. We, we can help with that. You know, yeah. luckily we have four days, five, six days a week. That's all we do. Yeah. So we see lots of solutions, lots of ideas, lots of different market sectors. Come and pick our brains. So that's what I say, really get us involved. Pick our brains and see- At the what early stage. At the early that's stage. one of the crucial things. Because yeah, you say, you, what you're describing sounds a lot like how my, my wife and I discuss home decorating. We yeah. start the dream and then we work our way back from there. But um, but you know, that totally makes sense. And I think that point about you know, it's really exciting. You know, we've got a lot of growth happening, lots of lots of new developments, a really great time to be involved in cold chain. Um, so and everyone, and, and I think what we came from the panel was there's a space in it for everybody, from the biggest right down to the smaller, small operators. Um, but the crucial thing is making sure you're clear on what you want to achieve and make sure you're putting in place the tools and the equipment and the and the and the facility yeah. that like, will do yeah. that job. Silly things like column positions in the building. Well, guess what? Most pallets are 1200 by 11 or 1200 by 800 or 1200 by 800. Uh, yeah. There are common sizes that we all work to. Mm. The amount of times you see a building and guess what? The column is where the gangway needs to be, the transfer aisle, you know, yeah. etc. Let's look at a building that we can compartmentalize to give that flexibility we talked about. Yeah, let's have a bit of chill. Let's have a bit of frozen. Let's have a bit of ambient. If we can turn chambers on and off, then it gives the business that future proofing. If, if, we, we can start with very simple systems. We can build in expansion and automation. You don't have to go automation on day one. Yeah, yeah. You, you, but again, it's that involvement. And, and, and that's what we like. We like to be involved from the beginning, if possible. We'll help you design your solution. Uh, Brilliant, David. Thank, yeah. thank you very much. Thanks very much for supporting today, and thank you for those no those final thoughts. We we will come back to this, you know Dexion are a member of the Cold Chain Federation, um, and we will be talking more in coming months and years about these sorts of specific uh, issues around the opportunities and the exciting innovations around materials handling. And we're delighted to have you on board as a partner to do that. So thank you very much, David. Thank you. So I'm just wrapping. Sorry, David. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you all. So right, I'm conscious that we've gone over our hour and fifteen. So just very quickly. There's more to come. The next cold chain conversation is about feeding the city, which is one of the topics we touched on very briefly today. I'm gonna to talk about that on June. So please sort of put that in your diary, 9th of June, a session like this, talking about those big challenges around future movements around our urban centers and how the cold chain needs to adapt to meet that. But we've got really great stuff coming on before that. We're gonna be talking to Estan in more detail about their Dunkirk development um, in, in, in the coming, coming days. Look out for a date for that. And the most immediate big thing is our, um, sorry, is our climate change week in May. So in a couple of weeks time, which is we're really looking at those big issues around around the future policy on climate change issues and how that what that actually means, those global ambitions mean for UK cold chain. Thank you all very much for your time as ever. I'm delighted by the amount of people that took part in today's session. Um, you know, I'm glad that we're sort of finding topics that people are finding interesting. Um, if you've got any thoughts or ideas on things we should be talking about, please get in touch. Um, and if not, please enjoy the rest of your week, enjoy the sunshine um, and um, see you again soon. Thank you all very much.